is to record the bit of the lesson that you missed um, to go through question 12 and question 13, uh, just with a little bit of annotation on the actual question itself. So we're going to start with this question <clears throat> and we're going to look carefully at the data it gives us on the graph. So we can see on the X axis at the bottom, put X there, we might have five different con concentrations of substrate and these are five separate mixtures. And what the guys in the experiment have done is to record, if you look at the Y axis, the initial reaction rates at each of those five different substrate concentrations. Now they plotted, so I put data points here. So this would be for no inhibitor, plotted the initial reaction rates at each of the five different starting concentrations of substrate. So this data on this graph does not represent time on the x-axis. It represents five different separate substrate concentrations. So five separate mixtures in five separate test tubes and they've recorded the initial rate of reaction in arbitrary units. So in order to work out the initial rate of reaction for each individual substrate concentration, you do not need to draw a tangent here because we do not have time on the x-axis. All you have to do to work out initial reaction rate is pick off a particular substrate concentration and then you're going to kind of read it off the y-axis, it gives us the initial reaction rate. Now, hopefully what you can see is at the higher substrate concentrations, the data with competitive inhibitor, yeah, the initial reaction rate is very similar, if not the same as the initial reaction rate for no inhibitor. Now we know with the competitive inhibitor, we can uh, dilute out the effect of the competitive inhibitor by having higher substrate concentrations. That makes it more likely that the substrate binds to the active site. We get more enzyme substrate complexes and therefore we get a higher initial reaction rate. If we compare that with the non-competitive inhibitor, so this is like the dotted line. At the higher substrate concentrations, we can see that the initial reaction rates is 10 grams per decimeter cubed, which is significantly lower than the initial reaction rates with the competitive inhibitor. So even at higher substrate concentrations, there isn't an increase in the initial reaction rates when we use the non-competitive inhibitor. <clears throat> so the exam questions that you guys will get will be referencing what happens at the higher substrate concentrations. With a competitive inhibitor, the reaction rate or the initial reaction rate here is nearer to the scenario with no inhibitor. With a non-competitive inhibitor, we can see that the reaction rate or the initial reaction rate is significantly lower, even though we've got a really high substrate concentration. Now, question A says explain the results without inhibitor. So this is the normal scenario we would have where we've got low substrate concentrations and a lower reaction rate or initial reaction rate. We then increase the substrate concentration and we get a higher initial reaction rate. So that means the substrate concentration is limiting there. If we increase the substrate concentration even higher, we start to see the initial reaction rate remains constant. And therefore, it's the enzyme that becomes limiting at the very high substrate concentrations. So initial reaction rate is higher when we increase the starting substrate concentration because we know with the higher substrate concentration, more enzyme substrate complexes, complexes can form. The initial reaction rate is the same or remains the same even at higher starting substrate concentrations as all the enzymes are in use, the active sites are all in use, 100% in use. Therefore, it's the enzyme that is limiting. So we could say enzyme is limiting at the very high substrate concentrations. <clears throat> Mark point two. Right, question B says the graph shows that the maximum initial reaction rates 
when a competitive inhibitor was present is different from that when a non-competitive inhibitor was present. So this question, OK, we're just going to circle it. So the maximum initial reaction rate okay, for a competitive inhibitor is different. We could say it's higher for the competitive inhibitor. So let's have a look at the answer. So the competitive inhibitor we know binds to the active site of the enzyme, but but the non-competitive inhibitor does not bind to the active site, it binds away at the allosteric site. The competitive inhibitor that binds at the active site does not cause any change in tertiary shape of the enzyme, but binding of the non-competitive inhibitor at the allosteric site alters the tertiary shape of the enzyme and therefore changes the shape of the active site. So we've got this idea that the non-competitive inhibitor is altering the tertiary shape of the enzyme, but the competitive inhibitor does not alter the tertiary shape. So mark point number three, with a competitive inhibitor, the higher substrate concentrations, this is really, really important. We know um, the enzyme is still available and therefore we're going to get higher initial reaction rates nearer to the, uh, the mixture with no inhibitor. But the non-competitive inhibitor that binds at the allosteric site alters the tertiary shape of the enzyme. Therefore, even at higher substrate concentrations, we do not get an increased initial reaction rate because the enzymes are no longer available or have a different tertiary shape. Now, mark point number four, at the higher substrate concentrations, the likelihood of enzyme substrate complexes increases with the competitive inhibitor because we can dilute out the effect of the competitive inhibitor, but that is not possible. Okay, when we use the non-competitive inhibitor, mark point number four. Right, this question was a little bit trickier, so we have to circle what it gives us. So it's saying the Michaelis constant, or Km, is the substrate concentration. So we're going to be looking for substrate concentration at which the initial reaction rate given on the y-axis, okay, is half of its maximum value. So the Km is the substrate concentration at which the initial reaction rate is half of its absolute maximum value. How could you use this KM value on Michaelis constant to determine the type of inhibition that occurs in an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Now it tells us to use the information from the graph. So we've got to go back to the graph and we've got to do what it says. So let's have a look at the, the data again. Now, KM, go back to what it tells us, is the substrate concentration at which the initial reaction rate is half its maximum. So if we take the no inhibitor mix, we can see the maximum initial rate of reaction with no inhibitor is 20 arbitrary units. But it says the Km value is the substrate concentration on the x-axis at which this is half. So half of 20 is 10. So half of the maximum initial reaction rate is 10 arbitrary units, which gives us a substrate concentration of five grams per decimeter cubed. Now, if we did the same for the two different types of inhibitor, we could have a look at the competitive inhibitor first. So if you look at the maximum initial reaction rate, that is also 20 arbitrary units. And this is for the competitive inhibitor. Now, half of 20, like we just said, is 10. Now, if we go and draw a line across this time where it hits the uh, dotted curve, that is going to give us 7 grams per decimeter cube. So half of the maximum initial reaction rate is 10. That gives us a substrate concentration of 7. 7 is obviously higher than 5. If we do the same for the non-competitive inhibitor this time, this one, 
The maximum initial reaction rate we can see is 10. This is the maximum initial reaction rate of 10. Half of that is five. So if we go across, we can see here that five arbitrary units is equal to five grams per decimeter cube. So actually, if you calculate the Km value, we will see that for no inhibitor, it's the same as with the non-competitive inhibitor. It's five grams per decimeter cube. With the competitive inhibitor, the Km value comes out at seven grams per decimeter cubed. So therefore, we can use the differences here to work out which is the competitive inhibitor, because it will have a different Km value, and which is the non-competitive inhibitor, because that will have the same Km value as with no inhibitor. Okay. So if you guys just want to quickly look through that and mark it, I'll try and get rid of the... <clears throat> Sorry, there you go. So the reaction with the non-competitive inhibitor has the same value of Km, which is five grams per decimeter cubed, as with no inhibitor presence. The reaction with the competitive inhibitor has a higher Km value compared to no inhibitor, that's seven grams per decimeter cubed. So the Km value is higher for the competitive inhibitor, but the non-competitive inhibitor will be the same value as if no inhibitor was used. So that allows us to see which inhibitor is which type. Yeah. Okay, this question then, we are gonna do some annotation. This is what I did in class earlier. Um, so it says at the top, tyrosine kinase, okay, it's a type of enzyme. That is found in human cells. It can exist in a non-functional form and a functional form. So on the left here, we've got the non-functional form. On the right hand side, we've got the enzyme, the tyrosine kinase, that is in, in the functional form. Now, if you look at the diagram on the right hand side, hopefully you can see that the shape of the active site is complementary to the shape of part of the substrate. So the substrate combined into the active site of the functional form of the enzyme. Now, in order to get that functional, correctly shaped active site that's complementary to the shape of the substrate, okay, the phosphate group has to bind away from the active site. So if we get a phosphate group that binds here away from the active site, it alters the shape of the active site to become complementary to the shape of the substrate. So we've said that if a molecule binds away from the active site and it alters the shape of the active site, that's only what we call a non-competitive inhibitor. This time, though, the shape of the active site is becoming complementary to the shape of the substrate. So we can call this phosphate group actually not an inhibitor, but an activator. When it binds, it alters the active site shape, so it's now complementary to the shape of the substrate. So we're going to get more enzyme substrate complexes. So this is a mechanism inside cells that can actually switch on an enzyme or switch off an enzyme. The phosphate group that adds to a site away from the active site here alters the tertiary shape of the enzyme, so the active site is complementary. It's activating the enzyme this time and not inhibiting the enzyme. So let's have a quick look at the answers then. So the addition of the phosphate group in black, that black circle, changes the tertiary shape of the tyrosine kinase enzyme, changes the shape of the active site. That is now complementary to the shape of the substrate. So therefore, there's more enzyme substrate complexes. There actually would be no enzyme substrate complexes in the non-functional form of TK without the addition of the phosphate group. So this time the phosphate is an activator and not an inhibitor. <clears throat> okay, the next part of the question then says, binding of the functional form of TK tyrosine kinase to its substrate 
leads to cell division. So the functional protein or the functional enzyme, when it forms ES complexes to make the product, that allows cells to divide, it promotes cell division. Chronic myeloid leukemia is a cancer caused by a faulty form of TK. Cancer involves uncontrolled cell division, that's unregulated cell division. Right? So there's no control over how fast the cell divides, divides too quickly. So if you look at the active site of this faulty form of TK, that active site shape is actually complementary to the shape of the substrate that we had in the other diagram. So this faulty form, even though it says faulty, is actually always active because the substrate combines to the active site to form enzyme substrate complexes and therefore product. The product stimulates cell division. Then it says, suggest how the faulty TK leads to chronic myeloid leukemia, how it leads to. So let's look at the answer. The faulty TK enzyme has functional, a functional active site even without phosphates. So without the addition of the phosphate, the shape of the active site is complementary to the shape of the substrate. Therefore, the faulty tyrosine kinase is always functional. OK, it's functional all the time. It's not being switched off. So because it's active all the time and we're getting product being formed all the time, it's going to eventually lead to uncontrolled cell division, which we know causes leukemia, which is type of cancer of the white blood cells. Now, the third question is about imatinib, which is a drug which has been used to treat this type of leukemia, this type of cancer. Then it says, figure three shows how the drug imatinib inhibits the faulty TK. So we know the faulty TK has got an active site that is complementary in shape to the shape of the substrate. It's always active. Now, imatinib can bind to the allosteric sites away from the active site on TK. That's going to alter the tertiary shape of the faulty TK enzyme and it's going to alter the shape of the active site, which is not, not now complementary to the shape of the substrate that we had at the start. So therefore, the faulty form of TK that was always active is not any, any longer active. The active site is not complementary to the shape of the substrate. No enzyme substrate complexes are going to be able to form. So the question says, use all the info, OK? to describe how this drug stops the development of this type of leukemia. So we can have a quick look at the answer. Imatinib, and do try to use the name, is a non-competitive inhibitor. It binds to a site away from the active site called the allosteric site. This alters the tertiary shape of the enzyme and it causes TK to be in a non-functional form. The shape of the active site is not complementary to the shape of the substrate. Therefore, enzyme substrate complexes cannot form. If there's no product being made, it means the uncontrolled cell division, which is characteristic of uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, is stopped or certainly slowed down. So it's really important, that third point, look, to say the consequence of steps one and two, or points one and two. So therefore, the uncontrolled cell division characteristic of the cancer is slowed down or stopped. OK, so that was basically what we went through in the first sort of 30 minutes of the lesson. So if you guys could just go through it yourself, if you've got any questions, just drop us an email Okay, and uh, see how you think about that. OK, I hope that helps.